We saw in the preceding lecture that the shepherd of Hermas is an example of an early Christian apocalypse. Apocalypses were a common genre in early Christianity and Judaism. Their basic function was to explain earthly realities through visions of heavenly truths. In this lecture, we will explore more fully what the genre entailed and consider a couple of other examples from early Christianity. To begin with, it's important to differentiate the genre apocalypse from the worldview called apocalypticism. Apocalypticism was a worldview widely shared among Jews and Christians around the beginning of the Christian era. As we've seen already, apocalypticists were dualists who maintained that the current evil age was soon to be overthrown by God, who would bring in his good kingdom in the near future. Apocalypticists believed that there were forces of good and evil in the world, with, the, uh, with God, of course, being over all that is good, and God having a personal opponent, the devil, all over all that is evil. Good versus evil. Uh, the world was originally created good, but something happened to corrupt the world. So apocalypticists were dualists in the sense that they thought in the present, there are two forces that are doing battle, uh, not just among themselves, but with people. So the, the people align themselves with the forces of good or the forces of evil, and everybody has to choose between good or evil. Apocalypticists, uh, by and large, did not maintain that this had been an eternal struggle between good and evil. This is one di thing that differentiates apocalypticists from, say, uh, those who were dualistic in other religious traditions, for example, in Eastern religions, where in some Eastern religions you have an eternal battle of good and evil. Apocalypticists uh, were Jews or Christians who believed that God had originally created the world so that the good and evil in the world now does not go back into eternity because at one point there was only God and he created all things and he created all things good. But something happened so that forces of evil came into the world, and at this point, there are battles now between good and evil. But just as there was not evil in eternity past, so there will not be evil in eternity future. There's evil only now in the, in the present time, because God will intervene in the course of history, overthrow the forces of evil, and set up his good kingdom on earth, and that will be an eternal kingdom. And so we're living in a kind of interim period in which, uh, which there is both good and evil in the world. This is how apocalypticists explained suffering. I mentioned in the previous lecture that, theod that, that apocalypses are a kind of theodicy, a kind of explanation for how it is God can be righteous if there's so much suffering. In particular, apocalypticists were troubled by the idea that those who are righteous suffer. It would make sense if people who were wicked suffer because then the forces of good would be punishing them for their evil. But the problem is when good people suffer, why is it that people who are completely innocent suffer? Why is it that babies suffer? Why is it that people who are righteous, adults who try and follow God and obey his law, why do they suffer? Apocalypticism explained that the reason uh, there is innocent suffering in the world is because there are forces of evil opposed to God who are opposed to God's people who are creating the suffering. This is the worldview, then, that scholars have called apocalypticism. There were a number of apocalypticists, in other words, people who held to an apocalyptic worldview, who never wrote an apocalypse. An apocalypse is a literary genre. Not everybody who was an apocalypticist wrote an apocalypse. Uh, for example, we have no evidence to suggest that Jesus ever wrote an apocalypse, even though he was an apocalypticist, and no evidence that Paul, the Apostle Paul, ever wrote an apocalypse. The term apocalypse refers to a specific genre of revelatory literature, a specific genre of revelatory literature that conveys an apocalyptic message. So, anybody who wrote an apocalypse was an apocalypticist, but not all apocalypticists wrote apocalypses. Okay? So the difference between the worldview and, and the genre. Apocalypses, these 
revelations, uh, the, uh, the apocalypse is the Greek word f- which uh, is translated into Latin as revelation, so that uh, apocalypse and uh, revelation are equivalent terms. These revelations could uh, be of two different types. So the genre divides itself into two major types of apocalypse. Some apocalypses contain visions of the future of the earth, visions of what will happen here on earth, usually in highly symbolic language. Scholars have called this type of apocalypse, where the future of the earth is seen, uh, they've called this type a historical type of apocalypse. The uh, One of the best examples of a historical type of apocalypse is the first apocalypse that we have, that we have, the earliest that we have, which turns out to be the book of Daniel in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. The book of Daniel uh, is, a, is a story of this, uh, of this person, Daniel, who allegedly is taken into exile during the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century B.C., and it's about his... Uh, about his life in Babylon, uh, but it includes a number of visions. Starting in Daniel chapter 7, it includes a number of visions allegedly given to this Daniel 550 years before the Christian era. In Daniel chapter 7, for example, we have a vision of Daniel, and this, this vision in Daniel 7 corresponds to a historical type of, uh, of the apocalypse. Daniel has this vision of the uh, sea being stirred up by the winds of heaven. And out of the sea, there comes uh, a a sequence of dreadful beasts, one after the other. These are horrible uh, beasts that come up out of the sea and take over the earth, one after the other. The final beast is especially awful with with terrible uh, uh, grinding teeth and... uh, and, and, uh, feet of iron that stamp out uh, all that is living, especially the saints of the Most High. And then Daniel has a vision, after seeing this fourth beast, he has a vision, which by the way has ten horns, and then it has a little horn that uproots three of the previous horns, so these are highly symbolic visions. Uh, He then sees one like a son of man coming on the clouds of heaven. And the beasts are, are, destroy, are destroyed. The fourth beast is punished and uh, taken out of power. Uh, and this one, like a son of man, is given authority over the earth forever and ever. So that uh, the, this one, like a son of man, inherits then the, uh, the, king, the eternal kingdom. This is a symbolic vision because then an angelic interpreter comes and tells Daniel what the vision means. It turns out these four beasts represent four kingdoms that are going to come on earth. And it doesn't take too much for an interpreter to realize what these four kingdoms are. Our scholars today are fairly unified. The first beast that comes out of the sea represents the Babylonians, during Daniel's uh, allegedly during Daniel's day. The second is the kingdom of the Medes. The third is the kingdom of the Persians. The fourth is the kingdom of the Greeks. Uh, brought with the kingdom of the Greeks, brought by Alexander the Great, who conquered that part of the world. These are all world empires. The uh, ten horns on this uh, fourth beast represent the uh, kings of the Seleucid Empire. The Seleucid Empire was the empire that ruled in Syria in the wake of Alexander the Great's conquering. Um, And so this is a vision that there will be four kingdoms on earth prior to the coming of the one like the Son of Man, who is interpreted as being another kingdom. But this time, instead of being a fierce beast out of the sea, this is one that comes from heaven. Well, who is this one like a son of man? Well, according to the angel's interpretation of the vision, this one like a son of man, this humane one, as opposed to these these grotesque beasts, this one that actually has human form, is none other than the saints of the Most High, who will inherit, then, the earth when the beasts are taken out of power. In other words, God will bring his kingdom to his saints when the earthly kingdoms are destroyed. Okay? And so it's a historical vision because it's giving a historical sequence of what's going to happen in the future. That's a historical type of apocalypse, Daniel chapter 7. There are other apocalypses that contain visions of the heavenly realm itself, again in highly symbolic language. So a prophet is taken up to heaven and sees what's happening in heaven. Here the idea is that what happens on earth is a reflection of what happens in heaven. So that 
the earth is a kind of shadow of the reality in heaven or a reflection of what's taking place in the heavenly realm. Scholars have called this second type of apocalypse a heavenly vision type of apocalypse. Now, there are some apocalypses that combine the two types. For example, in the New Testament book of Revelation, uh, as we'll see in more detail in a minute, the prophet John is taken up into heaven where he sees the heavenly realm and he has explained to him the future course of what will happen on earth. And so in some senses, the book of Revelation in the New Testament is a combination of the two traditional types, the historical type and the heavenly, heavenly vision type of apocalypse. Apocalypses of both types have a number of specific literary features in common. Just as short stories and novels and limerick poems and epics and every other uh, genre of literature has specific literary features that make it that kind of genre, so too with the apocalypse. There are specific literary features that are found in the apocalypses that make them apocalypses. It's not that every apocalypse has every one of these features. It's that, uh, that most of these features are found in most of the, apoc most of the apocalypses. To begin with, most apocalypses that we have from Jewish and Christian antiquity are pseudonymous. They're pseudonymous writings written in the names of famous religious persons of the past. In other words, who's ever actually writing the apocalypse uh, is claiming to be some famous religious person from antiquity. We have apocalypses that are written in the name of Paul, we have an apocalypse of Paul. We have an apocalypse of Peter. We have an apocalypse of Enoch. If you remember, Enoch was a, uh, a person from the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, who was seven generations removed from Adam. So he was seven, gen seven generations from Adam who didn't die. Uh, he was so righteous that God took him up into heaven without dying. Well, we have uh, apocalypses allegedly written by this person, Enoch. We even have an apocalypse allegedly written by Adam as in Adam and Eve fame. And so these are, uh, these are people who are claiming to be these people uh, who are seeing the future uh, course of the earth. Uh, Daniel appears to be a pseudonymous writing. Daniel allegedly is written by a character, Daniel, who's taken into exile during the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century. But in fact, it is almost certain that the book of Daniel was written in the 2nd century, 400 years later, uh, by somebody during the Maccabean Revolt that I referred to earlier, uh, when Antiochus Epiphanes was making life so miserable for so many Jews, this author is writing to explain that the end is coming very soon and Antiochus will be taken out of power by God himself. This ploy of pseudonymity, of writing in somebody else's name, was particularly useful for the historical type of apocalypse. Uh, for a reason you could figure out if you, th if you thought about it for a while. If somebody is living in the second century BC uh, and uh, they want to show that the suffering that the people of God are currently experiencing is soon to end, what, what this person could do is write an apocalypse pretending to be somebody who lived a long time ago. And this person who lived a long time ago would predict things that are going to happen. Now, the reader who's reading this thinks it really is this person from a long time ago who's predicting things are going to happen, and the reader knows those things have happened. Well, of course they've happened. The person writing them is living after they've happened, just pretending to be somebody who lived a long time ago. But then the author continues to predict things up to his own day, and you'll note when you get a historical type apocalypse like this, the predictions get more and more detailed as you get closer to the person's own day. They get to be very detailed, in, in fact. And then... He continues to predict what's going to happen after his day. Now, the reader doesn't know that he's predicting things are going to happen after his day because he doesn't know when this person's day is. The person thinks that this person is living in, in great antiquity. And so the predictions of what's to be in the future are of the same character as all the other predictions for the reader. So it looks like they're just as likely to come true as the things that were predicted that, in fact, are past. And so this is a way of convincing readers that the end is coming soon because when you predict the end, that prediction has the same value as predictions of things that for the writer are already past. And so this idea of pseudonymity turned out to be quite useful. 
that's why Daniel claims to be written, claims to be by somebody in the sixth century. It's actually written in the second century, and it traces the course of history up to its own time, and then indicates that the fourth beast and its ten horns are going to be taken out of power when one like a son of man is given the king. Well, if the tenth, uh, if, if if one of the horns, the final horn, is in fact Antiochus Epiphanes, the enemy of the Jews in the day the author's writing, and it's and it's predicted that he's going to be taken out of power, then the reader naturally thinks that 400 years ago, somebody saw all that's happening in our day as coming true and has indicated to us that, in fact, the end is near. So, apocalypses tend to be pseudonymous. Now, having said that, I have to point out that our two most familiar apocalypses uh, for this course, the Shepherd of Hermas and the Apocalypse of John, appear not to be synonymous, <laughs> as it turns out. Uh, Hermas is not writing in the name of some famous person from the past. Unless, unless Hermas was a famous person in his own congregation, and somebody later is pretending to be Hermas, but that seems unlikely. And the Apocalypse of John is written by somebody named John, but he doesn't claim to be any particular John. He doesn't claim to be John, the son of Zebedee, uh, the disciple of Jesus. So it may be pseudonymous. It may be somebody's claiming to be that John. But if, if so, he's not making a very strong claim to be that John. He just calls himself John. So first uh, characteristic of most of Apocalypse is usually they're pseudonymous. Secondly, Apocalypses contain a series of highly symbolic visions that are mediated by a heavenly messenger who explains their, their meaning. All of these apocalypses have highly symbolic visions that are given. Third, these highly symbolic visions often are violently repetitive. Now, when I say they're violently repetitive, I don't mean that uh, the visions are always about violence, although they often are. When you read the book of Revelation in the New Testament, these visions of the coming catastrophes hitting the earth are extremely, uh, extremely violent. Uh, they're massive destruction of, of uh, humanity on earth. But when I say that they're violently repetition, what I mean by that is that you can't trace the events that are narrated on a strict chronological line because the chronology doesn't work. What happens is the author sort of writes uh, around and around a problem. So he keeps repeating disasters that are continually going to happen. He doesn't mean this to be a kind of a linear development. Let me give you an example of, of how, why I know that that's true. Uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, there's a series of catastrophes that hit the earth. One, one set of catastrophes is, uh, um, happens when there, there's an event that takes place in heaven where um, a scroll is being opened up and each of the seals is being broken of the scroll. It's, it's sealed with a number of seals. And e when a seal is broken, then a catastrophe hits the earth. And the sixth seal gets broken and the author sees that there's a great earthquake. The sun becomes black as sackcloth. The full moon becomes like blood. The stars of the sky fall to the earth as the fig tree drops its winter fruit when it's shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll rolling itself up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Well, you'd think this is the end. I mean, the sun's gone, the moon's gone, the stars have fallen down, the sky's turned black, every, the whole earth is in this huge disruption. You'd think this is it. Well, this is not it. This is just chapter 6. <laughs> we have another 16 chapters to go. Well, how could there be anything to happen after that? Well, because it's not meant to be a, a kind of a chronological timeline of things that are going to happen. There, there are repetitions that violate the literal meaning of the text, and that's why I call them uh, violent repetitions in these visions. Repetitions of the same sequence of events over and over again, which violate any literal chronological reading. Another characteristic is that the of uh, uh, apocalypses generally is that these visions tend to move from disaster to triumph. The the visions uh, move from disaster to triumph. This is in order to show that even though things will get much worse uh, in our age, in the end, truth, justice, and God will prevail. Finally, the motivation of these apocalypses seems to be fairly consistent whether reading the Jewish or the Christian apocalypses. The motivation of the apocalypses appears to be to encourage those who are suffering and to urge believers to hold on to the end. Don't give up the faith, even if you're suffering for it, because the suffering 
is soon going to come to an end when God intervenes and brings in his good kingdom to earth. The best known apocalypse from Christian antiquity, of course, is the book of Revelation, which came into the New Testament. The book of Revelation records a series of visions given to a prophet named John, who has been exiled, apparently for Christian activities, to the Isle of Patmos. The book of Revelation begins by John being given a, uh, a revelation, a vision of Jesus himself in heaven. It continues with, uh, with the uh, prophet actually going up to the heavenly realm. Uh, he's, uh, in chapter 4, uh, the prophet uh, looks up to the sky and he sees there's a window in the sky. And he sort of shoots up through this window and he's up then in the heavenly realm. And he, he sees the throne of God himself and he sees God on the throne. In God's hand is a scroll that is sealed with seven seals. He's very upset because this scroll is sealed with seven seals and there's nobody who's worthy to break the seals. And so he gets upset because uh, he wants to know what's in the scroll. What's in the scroll that nobody can open is, in fact, the future course of Earth's history. But then he sees a lamb next to the throne of God, the lamb who was slain, obviously a reference to Christ, who in the Gospel of John is talked about as the, as the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Angelic uh, beings inform the prophet that the lamb is worthy to break the seals. The lamb receives the scroll from God on the throne and begins to break the seals. He breaks the seals one at a time. As he break, breaks a seal, a catastrophe hits the earth after each seal. When he breaks the seventh seal, we're introduced to seven angels who have, who have trumpets. And each angel blows his trumpet. And as he blows a trumpet, another set of disasters hit the earth. When the seventh angel blows the seventh trumpet, we're introduced to seven angels who have bowls, huge, immense bowls of God's wrath, which they pour out on the earth, and more disasters hit the earth one at a time. Finally, uh, when all hell is broken out on earth, there appears an antichrist figure and uh, who does war against Christ in heaven. Christ brings forth the heavenly armies to attack the Antichrist figure on earth, and of course, uh, without much of a battle at all, uh, Christ win wins. And then we're introduced to the future of what's going to happen after the forces of evil are destroyed. The evil forces are, in fact, taken and thrown into a lake of eternal fire for eternal torment. The earth is purged of all evil, and there's a thousand-year reign of Christ on the earth. After a thousand years of utopia on earth, then there's a final judgment in which all that is against God is judged, and God brings a new heavens and a new earth into existence, a new heavens and a new earth in which there'll no longer be any suffering. It's important to recognize that Revelation, like other apocalypses of, of Christian antiquity, was written in its own historical context, a context of Christian persecution and Christian apathy, near the end of the first century, when some Christians were experiencing severe suffering and others had grown complacent. And the book of Revelation is meant to address those concerns. It would be a real mistake to rip the book of Revelation out of its own context, as is usually done, and pretend that, in fact, it's written for our context. This normally happens when people think that the book of Revelation is providing us with a blueprint for our own future of things that are going to transpire sometime soon in the 21st century. In fact, the book of Revelation is not meant to be a blueprint for the future of our situation. The book of Revelation was written for its own situation at the end of the first century. The symbolic visions of the book indicate that it was meant for Christians living in the Roman Empire. Let me give you uh, one example of this. At one point in the book, in chapter 17, the prophet is given a vision uh, that is uh, the vision of, the, of what's called the great whore of Babylon. The prophet goes out in the wilderness and he sees a woman who is seated on a wild beast that's made of scarlet, who, that's scarlet, a scarlet beast. Uh, the beast has seven heads and ten horns. Okay, this sounds kind of like what you get in the book of Daniel, a beast with ten horns. The woman is dressed in purple and scarlet and bedecked with many jewels. She holds a cup 
in her hand that is filled with the abominations and impurities of her fornication, it says. And on her forehead is written a name that is um, called a mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of whores and of earth's abominations. Uh, And the woman, as it turns out, is drunk, drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the witnesses to Jesus. Well, the prophet sees this. They can't make heads or tails of it. And so, as happens in the Shepherd of Hermas and in other early apocalypses, an angelic figure comes to interpret the vision. And the angelic vis- uh, the angelic interpreter leaves no doubt concerning who, in fact, this whore of Babylon is. Babylon, by the way, was seen as the city in antiquity who was the that was the enemy of Israel because the Babylonians conquered ancient uh, ancient Judea and destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple. So Babylon was a nickname for the enemy of God's people. Well, as it turns out, uh, this woman also represents a city. We're told that uh, this woman is seated on this, this beast with seven heads, and the angel says the seven heads represents the seven mountains on which the woman sits. Moreover, the ten horns represent ten kings. Well, kings of what? Kings of a city. What city? What is the city that was built on seven mountains? Well, as any any student of uh, the ancient world knows, Rome is the city built on seven hills. And at the end of the angel's interpretation, he says that the woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. This whore of Babylon is none other than than the city of Rome, who uh, has committed abominations against the earth, fornicated with the kings of the earth, in other words, engaged in economic uh, transactions that are, uh, that are abominable and against the will of God. She's drunk with the martyrs of Jesus because Rome had started persecuting Christians, especially under Nero, uh, the Neronic persecution. And so this woman, in fact, is a vision of Rome, uh, Babylon is the code name then for Rome, the current enemy of God. Well, so uh, the book of Revelation is to be read as a book that was speaking to its own day of, of the situation that was transpiring in the Roman Empire. And the author's message, as the message of most apocalypses is, that the people of God need to hold on because God will soon intervene and overthrow the Roman Empire and bring in his good kingdom. Apart from the book of Revelation, there were other apocalypses that were very popular in the early church, including, as we've seen, the Shepherd of Hermas, which was included in several, uh, by, by several authors as part of the canon of the New Testament, and another book that was also considered canonical by some Christians in the early centuries. This other apocalypse, which uh, in some parts of the church nearly made it into the canon, is the Apocalypse of Peter. The Apocalypse of Peter is a book which is uh, it's very different from the book of Revelation because it's not giving a future sketch of what's going to happen to earth. It's a sketch of what happens when people go to heaven and hell. In the Apocalypse of Peter, the uh, apostle Simon Peter is given a guided tour of heaven and hell by Jesus himself. And he sees the torments of the damned and the blessings of the righteous. Of particular interest to most readers are the torments of the damned. People are punished for the sins that they have committed. For example, those who have blasphemed against God are hanged by their tires, by, by hung, they're hanged by their tongues over, uh, uh, over unquenchable flame. Women who have plaited their hair in order to be attractive to men so that they commit a fornication are hanged by their hair over eternal flame. The men who have committed fornication with them are hanged by their genitals over eternal flame. There are people who chew their tongues and are tormented with red-hot irons and have their eyes burned out. Those are those who have slandered, uh, the, those who have slandered God. There are others who have done deeds and deception in their lives. They have their lips cut off and fire enters into their mouths and into their entrails. Uh, There are people who are dressed in rags and filthy garments and uh, they suffer unceasing torture. These are those who grew rich and trusted in their riches and uh, despised the widows and the orphans. uh, There's another place where men and women are up to their, their knees in muck. We're told that those who are uh, those are people who lent out money at interest. 
<laughs> so uh, the, the bankers among us uh, take heed. Uh, the apocalypse of Peter then is designed to show that in the afterlife, God will resolve the problems of evil by rewarding the faithful and punishing the, um, punishing the wicked. Well, to sum up, uh, the, uh, even though the shepherd of Hermas is the only apocalypse that we find among the apostolic fathers, just as the book of Revelation is the only apocalypse in the New Testament, the shepherd was the kind of book that enjoyed considerable popularity among Christians in the first two centuries of the Common Era. It's a book in which a mortal prophet has a vision of heavenly rea- realities that help make sense of our mundane life, our life of suffering, our life of pain here on earth.